Now, you, you grew up in, in Gothenburg. Yes. Now, this is a port, a port industrial city. Port town, industrial town, shipyards. You know, maybe you heard about Volvo, car industry, heavy trucks, uh, very industrialized city. And the used to be sort of the connection, it was the way to beat the Danes, because oh, the Danes right. would control all the trade going into the Baltic Sea, and the only way to, to get around them was through Gothenburg. Oh, I see. So therefore it became a very important and the Norwegian the Norwegians were ruled by Denmark for a long time, weren't they? Yeah, yeah it was sort of a subsidiary of so Denmark. So the Swedes, you've had, you've, had to, you've had to take on Norway and Denmark to get it. Yeah, yeah. Norwegians were never a problem, but the Danes, you know, yeah, Copenhagen were really tough, yeah. so. Yeah, we know what they're like, yeah, <laughs> okay. Um, now, now um, you know, I, I was thinking about the book Why Nations Fail at Harvard and MIT, and it was some, yeah. talking about Sweden. Sweden, in, uh, when there was uh, in the late 19th century, was actually a very poor place. Um, yeah. I studied in, in Minnesota in America, which was full of Swedish immigration yeah. in the 19th century. Was that when Sweden was principally rural? You could say that, first of all, uh, part of, I think, of, of turning around Sweden was that about 20% of the population actually went to pretty much Minnesota. Chicago uh, also was a big place. Uh, I think uh, after Stockholm, the second largest Swedish city for many, many years was actually Chicago. Chicago, in the yeah. Century. Yeah. So, um, you know, Sweden was, uh, used to be actually a rather rich country, partly like this, this part of Australia based on copper ore. Yes. Uh, and from that we built uh, wealth, and through wealth we could build a mighty army and navy and so forth. So Sweden became sort of the Baltic, you know, uh, little empire in the 17th century. But through wars, and I would say what destroys nations typically, and you know, you build up your economies, etc., is of course through war. So we were fighting these wars, and we were totally destroying all that that was built up in terms of innovation, technology, uh, and economic wealth. So as you say, in the early 19th century, Sweden was one of the poorest places uh, in Europe and on Earth, actually. Um, and part of that process, uh, Finland had been a natural part of Sweden since, you know, before the Middle Ages, back to sort of the Viking era. So Russia took their chance to... As they do. Yeah, and uh, so they took, took Finland from us. Uh, so we lost Finland in 1809, uh, and, and uh, it ended actually with a military coup in Stockholm. So they told the king to get out of the castle, get on a horse, and ride somewhere else, and he did, and he went down into Europe somewhere. And they were looking for a new leader uh, to lead the country into sort of back into some sort of prosperity again. And they found a, one of Napoleon's marshals, Jean-Baptiste oh, wow. Bernadotte, who was a common man down from the south of France and made his way up with a career in those days because you, you know, the nobility and everything had you know, lost their position after the French Revolution. So, you know, just people from you know, normal walks of life could so make careers sort of, a, yes. Mm. So he was French, he had become one of Napoleon's marshals. So he took on the job, he was given the job of becoming king of Sweden. And still the Swedish royal family is the descendants of, of this. So so still so the, their family name is Bernadotte. You're so originally French? It's a French family that oh, yeah, rules Sweden. Yeah. Yeah. So um, he was supposed to be the great leader. Um, actually, what turned out later was that he didn't become really the great leader. I think his idea was, if he could take Sweden as sort of the little, poor little, tiny country up in the north, that could be a way in his career to come back to Paris and take over after Napoleon, his rival. So what, in order to do this, they actually joined up with a Russian Tsar uh, in the war between uh, Russia and, and France. So he um, quickly used the Swedish army to fight his old French army with the Russians and went all the way back to Paris. And the Tsar tried to install him on the throne sort of after Napoleon. Uh, but the nobility and the leadership of France said, no, we don't really trust this guy. <laughs> he used to be one of our marshals and generals. Uh, he went to Sweden and he turned the soldiers of Sweden on, onto us. So, um, so he was sent back to Stockholm and he was a very depressed king actually. And uh, we still talk about uh, running your government in the bedchamber because mm. actually he would, he would have all the ministers come around the bed. He would pretty much never leave the bed. <laughs> Is that right? No, so I think he, about on the his, whole, his whole career stopped there. So, but Sweden anyway, with, without having maybe the great leader, um, started to shift, uh, and, and that's back to what you mentioned, why nations fail book, changed the institutions, mandatory schooling, 
free press, a number of things came um, sort of mid 19th century that really transformed Sweden. So it took a crisis. Open trade, et cetera, mm. sorry. Yes. It, took a, it took a crisis yeah, yeah, yeah. to do it. So, uh, and that was, was uh, tough changes, but so the institutional change came, let's say, oh, 1840s, 1850s, and then in the, 18, in the late 19th century, you would see companies like Ericsson evolve and, mm -hmm. and Alfa Laval and these that later became the great companies. So we had a big transformation. So, and then we managed to keep after the wars, First and Second World War, which of course was very important for us, not, not to have our factories bombed, etc. You stayed, you stayed neutral, but, Stay neutral, but you, yeah. I mean, uh, uh, many, uh, many of Europe's uh, Jews were protected by Sweden, weren't they? Many of them got yeah, out of yeah. Germany and Poland and hid in Sweden yeah, a lot during of them. the war. Also from Norway, Denmark. Was it Wallenberg well. who got them out of Hungary? And Wallenberg got them out of Hungary. Yeah, he became yeah. a big hero after that, absolutely. Yeah. So the Swedes had quite a good record. I mean, the Norwegians put their hand up and surrendered, but the Swedes stayed neutral. The Norwegians, the Danes uh, put their hands up. The Norwegians yeah. actually fought a little bit, so there were Did a little they? bit of actually um, war going on. Denmark was more like, um, you know, uh, we give up there. So, and I think, I don't know, this is maybe going too much into the detail, but I think, um, when, and I think some of the records show that the decision from Hitler to invade also Sweden was, it was extremely close. And uh, I, I have a you know, little hypothesis that actually Hermann, Hermann Göring, who's you know, one of the obviously key people, he was married to Swede. Ah. I've been married to Swede, I've been married into the Swedish nobility after the First World War. Mm. So it, it is possible, actually, that in the central headquarters, when they were talking about should we invade next month, maybe he would say, ah, we wait with that. We can probably get the iron ore anyway yes. coming out of the north of Sweden somehow. Yeah, so they left them alone. So they decided not to. So yeah. that was very lucky for Sweden. Yeah. But it was very close. They were, all the plans were there, mm. how mm. to go in with the, with the armies and navies. And, and, the, and the Swedes were so, so small, they wouldn't have lasted long, would they? They'd have to fight. No, no. We, no. After the First World War, we pretty much, in the 1920s, we closed down the whole military, mm -hmm. basically, so there was mm -hmm. not much there. Well, it, it, the Great Depression was very important in Australia and here in South Australia in the sense that when the Great Depression hit uh, the Premier's plan, the governments of the day, they, they, they cut the budget, um, mm -hmm. they cut the basic wage by 10% in 1931, they had uh, the exchange rate on the gold standard, and, uh, and they basically put up tariffs. You know, they did mm. everything wrong. Mm. And yet when Australia faced the global financial crisis, we had a fiscal stimulus, we made sure that interest rates were low, we ensured that wages grew, mm. and we had a floating exchange rate, we kept tariffs low. Mm. You know, we did almost the exact opposite of the, the 30s, and in yes. many ways, the 1930s shaped Australia's response to the most recent global slump. Mm. What experience did Sweden have in the, in the 30s? I think Sweden, uh, First of all, uh, I mean, every, you know, the whole world was uh, uh, affected by, by the shocks, and we had, and if, if, I don't know if you I don't remember, if you remember the, the old matchboxes, uh, Swedish match. Yes, um, yes, yes. <laughs> they almost built up a monopoly uh, in the 19th century of matches around the world. Yes. Um, and uh, the guy who created this, his name was Eva Krieger, and he became, a, some of you who read history and sit in this, remember his name, and he, you know, developed a, you know, an enormous sort of kind of banking operation, you know, lending money to governments, et cetera, and building up companies all around the world based on, on the wealth that he created from, from matchmaking. So um, I guess now, this is 1932, uh, this whole thing collapsed for him, and he uh, shot himself in Paris. Oh, uh, and all of sort of his empire kind of collapsed, and I think about between 10 or 20 percent of all savings in Sweden of ordinary people uh, disappeared. Well, that a huge that financial night. collapse. Yeah. yeah. So it was a big shock also to Sweden. But I think, again, given that we, our industries were in good shape after the First World War and all that, so I think Sweden continued. But of course, and you know, everyone had problems and then into the Second World War. But were they, were particularly they? after the World War, you know, mm. uh, Europe was destroyed. Mm. Uh, yeah. In Sweden, we have the steel industries and the mining and all that. So, so all those companies and all those industries, they just had to decide which customer to would be delivered to. I mean, was, you, all we, of Europe were asking for. Were you for already? Products. I mean, were you already an open economy in the 30s? 
you already argued. Yeah, yeah. And then yeah. actually took, that change um, happened as part of this, I say, the institutional shift in the 19th century. And there was a big fight as in every country, you know, should we protect ourselves or should we open up? And the, the, uh, the, um, the free trade is sort of won. And um, they did a couple of things. They uh, opened up for free trade and they also said we should allow for foreign investment to come in, particularly the British money, to build our railways and our industries. So a lot of the boost to Sweden, as I said, was a very poor country, came from, from foreign, uh, foreign money, foreign investment. Mm. And from, uh, like today's Chinese investment, right? Yes. Like Volvo is today, Volvo Car is a Chinese company, and Saab. Saab has got Chinese money. That was closed mm. down, the government did not bail out Saab. Uh, now they're, you know, a Chinese company setting up uh, electric, uh, uh, you know, using the factory for electrical cars and so forth. So, but in those days it was about British, British money, British investment, British technology uh, to build up the infrastructure of Sweden. So free trade was part of this all Part of the start. Yeah. I mean, because, you know, as you know, in Australia, we had, uh, in federation, a pact that said uh, uh, if we had a free trade, a protection, mm. and a Labor Party, and the Labor Party originally in New South Wales uh, had an alliance with the free traders, and in Victoria they had an alliance with the protectionists. Okay. And so when we mm. became a federation, the protectionists, uh, Alfred Deakin said, well, if you give us protection, we'll give you an arbitration court, which of course had originally come from South Australia. Yeah. And so we ended up being protectionist by uh, convenience. And then it wasn't until 1983 when the, the 80s, modern yeah. Labor government yeah. opened up uh, Yeah, which uh, made market. a big, I think, a huge uh, impact onto Australia, right? And this mm. opening up, uh, becoming part of the, of the global economy, rather than a protected economy where you would do everything here, cars. Well, uh, well what's things. interesting, because I mean, we, you know, when I was sitting in this hall 30 years ago, um, Australia had one of the highest unemployment rates in the world, mm -hmm. uh, in the OECD. Uh, one of the highest inflation rates. So we won the Olympic gold medal for strikes. Okay. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> I didn't you, know those Olympics. <laughs> well, well, we won it every year. Uh, and of course, we didn't have as many foreign students or foreign tourists as we, we have now. And yet you sit here 30 years, ago, you know, 30 years later, uh, we're down under the down wonder, the doyen of the, the, the OECD. No. We no. got through the global financial crisis without a, a, a scratch. But a, 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 as an open economy, but as an economy that still has uh, an arbitration system with fair, the Fair Work Commission. Mm. It still mm. has uh, uh, Medicare and education. So in, mm. in many ways, as we've been open, um, policy makers have said, well, we have an open economy, but you've still got to have labour market institutions mm. Mm. to ensure that people who get hurt um, can get retraining and, and, and find a job. Right? Well, that's <laughs> the Swedish model, right? the Swedish model, isn't it? It's, it's yes. not the Anglo-Saxon model, at least. That's, uh, it's quite different, I think. Well, I was going to ask you about that, because mm. I was interested in... Um, uh, when we uh, in Australia in, in the press talk about the car industry, mm -hmm. uh, very important here to South Australia, most of the free market economists will say um, stop propping up the car industry, stop mm -hmm. propping up manufacturing, don't use taxpayers' money. While in, 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 Sweden, in Sweden, you have an interest in innovation and industry policy, it's a little bit mm -hmm. more uh, mm -hmm. um, eclectic, I suppose. Yeah, I think, so no, it's. <laughs> It's not, I mean, economists try, sometimes try to make the world black or white, you know, it's mm. either policy or it's not policy. And mm. uh, that's why I think I, I think I spoke briefly about this also yesterday in the session, that there is this whole gray zone between, you know, heavy hand deciding this is the way we do it, or we own the car industry, or we run the car industry, to saying we didn't do anything. And if you look, and that's why using, um, or even in countries like United States, where they think of most things being sort of natural and sort of the invisible hand in terms of markets uh, is sort of uh, running the show. I use uh, Silicon Valley as an example when I talk about the construction of Silicon Valley. It's not just that it happened, it actually happened that there were decisions made by different actors on that cluster stage saying, for example, one of the important ones, Stanford, saying we will open up the doors for industry, we will allow for industry to co-locate so we can get some, some interesting things going on between research and our students and industry. Uh, and at the same time as most other universities would say, we don't want to touch, you know, be in contact with, with industry and so forth. So, and then there were, you know, defense contracts and a number of things that has to do with policy, Californian policy, it's federal policy, that plays a role. So it's, so it's not black and white like that. And I think, as you say, uh, also in Sweden, it's, uh, uh, you know, we have a number of policies that relates to innovation, uh, relates to 
uh, clusters or getting sort of the, you know, um, Sweden to play a role in the world economies uh, in various ways. And uh, uh, I think that's, e even, even, in, even in countries like the United States, it's actually, it's actually, uh, it's not black or white like that. Uh, but again, there was a big pressure on the Swedish government when Saab had problems. Some would say, you know, maybe they should bail them out. The government should own Saab. They should, you know, be producing cars. And, but the government said, no, we don't want to be a, we don't be, be running a car industry. We can certainly include policies for labor adjustment. Uh, they started some, some uh, policies around uh, innovation, around new engine technologies. I mean, there could be a lot of things done, which is not just to go in, give the company, you know, 100 million or, you know, take over ownership. So there are many, many ways of, I think, involving government in policy, which is not, you know, just give GM a billion or something or... or or, to, 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 go back, to go back to 1956 when you and Bjorn Borg were born, you know, we, we, you've taken us through the, the, the 19th century and the opening up of the institutions in Sweden. Mm -hmm. um, you did very well out of the war because yep. Europe was, was ruined. In, in 1956, you know, um, seven years after the war, this is when Australia signed their first trade agreement with Japan, for instance, to get into Asia. What did Sweden do then in the 50s and 60s? Was that the beginning of the Swedish model? I think we were abusing the Swedish model. Yeah, <laughs> right, 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 right. Uh, at least into the 1970s. The, the problem was that, you know, it's always... Uh, Sweden then did very well, as you say, and, um, uh, you know, every year or every decade, uh, you know, 1950s, 1960s, 1970s, you would see the economy rise. And the politician would say, oh, this is fantastic. It's probably us, you know, running this country. And um, if they didn't have enough money to, to run their policies, they would just increase taxes. So nothing really happened. They increased maybe average tax out of GDP from, let's say, 40% to 45, nothing, you know, they got more money, 45 to 50, 50, 50. So they just increased taxes. Um, and this went totally, I would say, astray. And it's not until, Somewhere into the 70s and the 1980s that they realized, you know, we, and you could just uh, look at the scoreboards. We used to be one of the richest countries, like GDP per capita, these mm -hmm. kind of mm -hmm. measures. And I think if you take around 1980, I would guess maybe we were down to a place maybe number 15 or 17 or something like that. So we could, you could even see these things, but the politicians, and, and this would be mostly the social democrats in those days, say, oh, no, no, that's not a problem. We, you know, we are... We are a very strong country, we have a good economy, and we can introduce pretty much any policy, uh, you know, to build up our uh, social welfare, etc. So that came to a halt. And I think exactly the time when the Australian politicians, came like through. Bob Hawke came to Sweden, was yeah. the time when we realized we have big problems, but probably they show, you know, they, sh they got a good, they obviously they got, got a good a show problem yeah. when they came to Sweden, you know, how, <laughs> how you could do everything with policy, uh, which was, of course, not true. So. We also went through a lot of institutional change. Um, uh, the debate about maybe becoming part of Europe started. Uh, maybe we should uh, open up our financial markets, etc. So a lot of things happened in those days. It took a little while, uh, and then into the 1990s, we were back on track again. And I would say today we are a very, very strong economy. And I don't know if you read the, the Economist, but um, early this year in February there was a big, big Viking with the horns, you yes, know, on so. the front page. Yeah. Uh, talking about uh, the Nordic uh, model and, and Sweden being the most competitive country in the world and all these things, talking about changes in our tax systems, changes in our legislation, uh, opening up for privatization, etc. A number of things that is part of, of Sweden today. So it's a, a big change also in Sweden because uh, it went astray, I would say, totally. Uh, I, I guess you're glad you stayed out of Europe. I mean, there's a new movie coming out called My Big Fat Greek Debt. Uh, yeah. <laughs> about, about the issues there. Um, uh, I mean, Sweden's had this interesting relationship with Europe, hasn't it? I mean, it's, uh, uh, it trades with Europe, but it's never yeah. got involved in institutions. No, it's, and I think, first of all, remember, uh, Sweden is, I think Sweden and France are the two countries in Europe where there's really the nation state and the capital that decides everything. It's a very strong nation state. It's not it's not a federal structure, it's really, you know, it's, mm. it's, it's one CEO that runs the country, I think, like mm. Paris and Stockholm are the two. Many European countries are not really countries, it's regions, okay? Yeah, if you Germany take and Italy, for example. Spain, I mean, I mean, yeah. if you go to the bus country, country, they talk about themselves as a country, it's not, you know, mm. we're not Spain. 
Mm. Uh, and even if, if probably if you read the press, these, these forces in Italy, Spain, other places, Belgium, are extremely strong today. And given that we have the European Union, there is a potential for regions to be world players you know, at the same time as I can stay uh, quite small. So the interest in the nation state is, is not as strong anymore, I would say, in many European countries, also Germany. But Sweden and France, I think, are the nation states uh, run by, by, um, by, the, by the, the capital, so to say. But isn't um, it, there's an irony with globalization, isn't it, that, uh, as people said, we've become more globalized and internationalized with international institutions. A lot of nation states have actually seen very strong regional nationalist movements mm. in, in Scotland and Wales and the Basque country yeah. and, uh, um. and parts of Italy with the Northern League and so on. Yeah. That, that's almost inevitable, isn't it, if people feel globalisation is not delivering for them? Yeah, I mean, you could take the small Baltic states, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, you can, you, you can see that you don't have to be, to be part of a big Soviet Union <laughs> to be no, part of no. uh, no. you know, so, so you can be a small player in the global market as long as you have open trade and, and so forth. So, so I think a lot of these regions, if they have a strong history of being a region, uh, you know, like Scotland, can easily see themselves as being a, a world player or part of the European Union, and they don't have to be part of Great Britain. So this, but this, this does not happen in countries like Sweden, where there's a very strong central uh, central power. But actually, you were asking something else. I forgot I was um, maybe... You, well, well, I was, well, I was, well, I was very interested in when you... I was reading some of your work and I was noticing that Sweden was very strong as an open economy to trade yeah. and investment and you've, as you've opened up your economy, you've made sure you've got very strong social institutions and, yeah. and, and provided social insurance. What I'm interested in now is in Australia, we've been quite successful as an open trading nation, mm. but um, immigration, asylum seekers, uh, the boats coming in from Indonesia has been dominating the political agenda mm. here, um, and we've always been this, you know, isolated island on the on the bottom of the world. Mm. How's immigration handled in Sweden? If you take that article, oh yeah, that's the way we talked about the article and the economist. If you take, mm. if you take. Um, so there's a lot about positive things going on in Sweden. The negative side is uh, immigration in terms of, you know, we also have, you know, burning cars and uh, issues in the, in the suburbs uh, of, of Stockholm and Malmö, etc. Sweden took on a, a huge wave of immigration um, in the last, you know, couple of decades, uh, particularly refugees from, you know, various parts of the world, including Middle East and Africa and so forth. And it's not that easy to, to get this to work, but I think part of the Swedish miracle is actually this immigration. We yes. get a lot of new people. Uh, they have a lot of energy. They bring you, uh, you know, um, ideas to Sweden and so forth. So I think, yes, it, it, it creates a very strong uh, economic and social force, also making Sweden more diverse. It's a more, it's more fun place to be actually today than it used to be. Uh, more ethnic, more restaurants. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it, 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 it has changed a lot, and I think. It's, but but on, on the other hand, this, you have the problems of you know, uh, people who are uh, have very low levels of education. They come out of uh, of areas where there is war. They are not been to school. The kids uh, they don't speak uh, foreign languages and things like that. So it is it is quite difficult, and we we're tackling that. But uh, and there's no simple answer to how to handle that. But I think. Overall, it has given an enormous energy input to Sweden to open it up, make it more diverse, more fun. Uh, if you come to Stockholm, it's a more fun place than it was a couple of decades laughs. ago. It's a barrel of laughs, Stockholm, isn't it? Sorry? It's a barrel of laughs, Stockholm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, are, they, are, they, are they encouraged to learn English or learn Swedish? Well, of course, they have to learn Swedish to go to school, but they are all offered uh, what we call home language. They can always mm. uh, get mm. uh, training with their home language to keep the two languages. And then you take English from when you're seven, I guess. Because like every Swede speaks English beautifully, don't they? I mean, yeah. it's quite, yeah. A, yeah. quite an advantage. Except for Bjorn Borg. <laughs> he, he, <well, laughs> he'd let his record do the talking, didn't he? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Um, I was interested, you know, going to now to, you know, your, your special research, the clusters and your, your sort of, you know, your work with Michael Porter at, at, at yeah. Harvard. I mean, uh, I, I find, um, you know, I've read your orange book and your green book and everything. Yeah. You know, it's oh. a, a fascina fascinating detail of research. I mean, how does it emerge? Do people just say, let's get everyone together and work together and 
hold hands? I mean, it, it, how do, what's, the, what's the intellectual framework behind clusters and innovation? Yeah. Uh, it's almost too good to be true, isn't it, a lot of it? I think holding hands, it's not holding hands. I think, I think actually uh, trust is very important in building mm. societies. If you have societies where there's no trust, uh, if there's no institution building where you sort of, you, you trust the government, you trust other people. If you think everyone is going to kill you, you know, if I'm, you know, expecting to, to stab your back all the time, you, you will never save anything, you will not plan for the future, I'm you will not, not the, build I'm your not house. I'm not in the Labour caucus, <laughs> so it won't happen, don't worry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so you, need, you need trust in society, I think that's very, very important. Mm. And, um, mm. um, and, and, you know, talking about clusters and innovation and all that, it's, it's, it's partly about... Um, people having faith in the future and investing in the future. Otherwise, why innovate? You just try to, you know, entrepreneurship in, you know, in the worst of places is about, uh, you know, just uh, using imperfections uh, in like, like a Soviet economy. No one would be an innovator. No one would be no, no. building something for the future. Because if you build something that was worth anything, someone would take it from you. So why do anything? Well, it's interesting with trust, isn't it? Because we, 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 uh, one of my, my supervisors here, Ian McLean at Adelaide University, wrote a book why Australia prospered, and in part of that book is mm -hmm. comparing Australia and Argentina. So, so mm -hmm. the 19th mm -hmm. century, Argentina and Australia were both, uh, uh, had natural resources, they had immigration, mm -hmm. uh, that had European settlement, and uh, you know, Buenos Aires was, was richer than Melbourne 100 years ago at the height yeah. of the gold yeah. rush. Yeah. Uh, and, and yet, um, uh, Australia's built very good institutions, uh, you know, mm -hmm. partly thanks to the, the British. Argentina's really struggled with its courts, with its parliaments, mm. uh, with its political system, with its institutions. Mm. And one reason people say is trust, because uh, if you can remember Maradona at the 86 World Cup, he scored the hand of God with mm. his fist. In the same game, he took the ball from the back line and went past nine English defenders. And they said, what was your proudest moment of your life? And he said, well, the, the hand of God, mm. you know, when he cheated. And, and, and I would have thought, well, wouldn't, you be, wouldn't, you, wouldn't you be proud of skill? <laughs> Not, not, not bending the rules. And if, if that's in your banking system, mm. if that's mm. in your financial system, mm. that's mm. in your political mm. system, mm. it doesn't matter how many natural resources you have, uh, the nation's going to fail, I would have thought. Yeah. Yeah. I did bring the book. It's not my book. <laughs> oh, yes, you can plug it's, that one. It's uh, yeah. Harvard Quinn. You know, yeah. James Robinson and Darren Asimov do uh, Why Nations Fail. I recommend this mm. book, actually, if you haven't mm. bought it. It's, uh, it's exactly about this, you know. Mm. Mm. And you can take... Uh, you know, they have interesting stories in the world, like, you know, you take Germany, you divide it by east and west, you take Korea, and you divide it north to south, etc. And in many of these cases, actually, the, the poor part, or in, actually in the, in the Americas, in, in back in the days when the, uh, the Spaniards came and, and the British later came, you know, the, the, the rich part was in the south and the poor part was in the north. Uh, North Korea, South Korea, same thing. I mean, all the richness, all the natural resources are in the north and not in the south and so forth. So then you put a dividing line, and then uh, some decades later, is because of these uh, differences in institutions that can be extractive or more, you know, inclusive, uh, you get enormous differences, like Australia versus Argentina. Well, it was interesting also that, I mean, they even did regions, you know, um, um, Mexico, the state of Mexico that's very close to Texas. Yeah. Uh, and then they compared the rent-seeking activities of the politicians in Mexico. Yeah relative to Texas, yeah. uh, and then uh, Congo and Botswana, similar natural resources, but Botswana's got very good institutions, yeah. Yeah. and again, Argentina yeah. and Australia. Yeah. Um, I mean, there's one thing in the book that, that intrigued me, one was um, some people say um, that if you live in a tropical place, productivity's low and institutions mm. aren't very good, and they always use the examples of uh, Central America and parts of Africa mm. and, and the north of Australia. Uh, and Countries like Sweden, because they're cold, things work, because everyone's working all the time, because they've mm. got to be inside. Mm. Mm. And it's like in the, in the US, Minnesota <laughs> does well, because all the Swedes are there, yeah. but Florida, they're yeah. struggling. Yeah. Uh, that, I mean, climate can't, can't, can't explain it, can it? No, I, no I, I, I think they try, at least in this book, to, to show mm. that, that um, these things of geography and climate and, and, and things, you know, they don't really work. Um, uh, and as I said, for example, some of the areas that are the, the hotter areas in, in the Americas were the rich ones that rich developed ones. all the institutions. If you go back before the, the Spanish came and introduced their institutions mm, <laughs> to mm, the system mm. um, in the 15th and 16th centuries. Before that, you had the richness was where people were supposed to be lazy, but they were not. Mm. So I, I think, no, it's not about, 
And, you know, it's not about having natural resources. It's not about where you are in terms of if it's cold or warm, etc. It's about how you build those institutions. And if there is a small elite taking all the money from the rest, mm. you're never going to get real wealth uh, going. You have to have a rather inclusive society, uh, a meritocracy where everyone has a chance. Otherwise, it's going to become a, a North Korea or a Soviet Union or whatever, or, or an Argentina, actually, uh, or Mexico. And so as, we as a Mexican example, you know, on one mm. side of the border, you have the... Once upon a time, you made this split, and the people on the north of that little border makes five times as much money. They are five times as healthier than the people south of that border, and they can see each other over the fence. Uh, like East Germany, West pictures Germany. In there, so, yeah. Well, perhaps we'll send that book to Gina Reinhardt in Perth, and she can have a, have a, have a, have a look at it. Um, uh, um, and, and, and finally, I mean, in Australia, we have a big debate about uh, geography and the tyranny mm -hmm. of distance. And uh, as you yeah. say, when we were off watching Sweden in the 80s and then we opened up our economy and, and made trade more free but mm -hmm. built up our institutions, um, well, Asia became so important. Yeah. So it's almost like the lucky country found itself in the right place at the right time, yeah. Yeah. but it had to build the institutions to take advantage of that. Do you think yeah. this power proximity is better now than the tyranny of distance that Australia used to worry about? First, I think the tyranny of distance uh, is partly disappearing. If, mm. if we, and, and in many markets, we are developing global markets, uh, markets for information, technology, capital, uh, and many products. Uh, and if, if markets are truly global, uh, and if you take, a, I don't know what you call that, like a globe you have on your desk at home. I do, yes. Yeah, yeah. and you put a pin on that. Mm. If you put it in Stockholm, or you know, you have a lot of, in your book, Sydney, Singapore, Shanghai, Seoul, St. Petersburg, here. It doesn't matter where you put that pin, it cannot be more or less central if the market is global. So location in that sense does not matter. You can even be in, you know, in a small part of the world where you used to, to grow fruit and uh, vegetables like California, and you can be the IT center of the world. So uh, it's not the location of that map, I think. Even though in certain instances, uh, take for example, attraction of students and, and mobility of people, maybe this proximity matters. So you, I, I, I realized a lot of, uh, of Asian students come, for example, to this city and so forth, and that's, uh, and maybe you get more here than we get in Europe uh, because of on, distance. On average, on yeah, average. On average yeah. So, but when it comes to markets, competing in markets, I think, and many people use the same argument in Sweden, we are in the periphery, it's very difficult, we're not in Central Europe, but if the markets are in China or United States, it doesn't matter if you're in Brussels or Stockholm, it's, you know, as, Central or decentral. Well, in the, I mean, in the 19th century, we, we sold wool all over the world. It didn't matter. We didn't have yeah. jet planes or anything, but we, 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 we managed to do it. So, yeah, yeah. so, so it can yeah. be done. Now, now finally, um, you know, you're an expert on industry policy and clusters and innovation. Um, I have to uh, help the Premier of South Australia design his international strategy around China and India and, and Southeast mm -hmm. Asia. And I've also got to advise him about uh, how you sell South Australia to the world and uh, how you, uh, what you decide about the car industry or the defence mm, industry mm. Or, or advanced manufacturing. You know, if you were going to give a little package to the package Premier, deal. Premier okay. what would you do? And I'll, I'll pass it on and how much give you, you 10%. How much do you pay? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. 20% for Swedes. Yeah, yeah. I take 1% of the <laughs> GDP growth of South Australia. <laughs> Um, yes, no. First of all, I think um, we talk about competitiveness of firms and nations. I think uh, another concept which is as important, particularly for a region or a nation, is attractiveness rather than competitiveness. It's about being attractive both to bring companies, foreign companies, investments, to bring students, uh, resources to the area, and to retain them, of course, to, to be an attractive place. So it's it's, it's not one big lever, you can do this thing and you will get innovation or you get economic growth. It's about many, many small levers, many small you know, institutions, laws and changing norms and mental models of people, etc. So I think, I, first of all, I would, um, uh, I would be traveling actually to be more open. Mm -hmm. uh, I heard a story of someone who got a very good degree here uh, yesterday, uh, you know, coming from another country and uh, in, in uh, I think it was um, uh, some bioscience, and uh, she could not stay in the country because she had to go back to her country, she wouldn't get a work permit, etc. In Sweden now we said the following, if someone can show that they get a job contract with an employer, 
they, got a, they get automatically a, a, a visa to stay. So if you can get a job, you get a visa to stay. Uh, and you can get so much more energy into your economy by bringing more people here. And I mean, Adelaide, it looks as if there is still room to build more <laughs> around the city yeah, here. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, so um, bringing in more people, talent, energy, uh, not just bring them here as students and then throw them back out, is, I think is stupid. Keep them here, tell them that this is the best place on earth to be, Adelaide or South Australia. Uh, so increase attractiveness, I think, uh, on people, uh, foreign companies, uh, capital ideas, venture capital, whatever it is. And that's, that's a big agenda to do that. Uh, and for people who actually go up there to say, you know, this is the place I want to be, like, not like you, move to Sydney, you should be here in Adelaide, right? Oh, I come here very, I come here a lot, yes. <laughs> um, it was, it's an interesting point, actually, because um, we, we had, a, uh, we had a, uh, an issue uh, where the advertiser said it's a brain drain, everyone's leaving South Australia. Mm. But then you, you go to London and there's, you know, many people from Adelaide, you know, working for the Times and working at Oxford University. There's people in Stanford, there's people in Brazil, there's people in Shanghai. Mm. And um, they all want to make a contribution to Adelaide yeah. and to the state. And many of them come back, many of them stay overseas for various reasons or stay in Sydney like me, mm. but they still make a, want to make a contribution. So in mm. many ways, if you have a network of globally connected South Australians who can open doors for companies, mm. you have um, people here with a, with a global outlook, and then you have immigration so that when you pull in all these people from all over the world that have studied here and, and encourage them to, to, to stay, you know, perhaps you ultimately have a, a nice balance between you know, local grown uh, people that have come here and then people from here that have you know, played a role in the international yeah, network. Yeah, it's like a diaspora out there coming back. Yeah, a bit of brain, gr okay. brain yeah. gain rather yeah. than brain drain. So yeah. you get a brain circulation, right? Because also, I mean, you don't want people just to stay here. You want them to go out and come back. I mean, you want some circulation going on. So it's both bay, uh, <laughs> drain and gain, so to say. At the same but time. if you're an attractive place to be in various ways to, to bring up a family, to study, to develop corporations, whatever it is, then uh, they'll come back. They well, have the networks we, we, here. We, we got some luck because National Geographic uh, was wanting to do a 21st century cities uh, TV program around the world, and National Geographic's got pretty big pull. And uh, they were going to go to Perth or Sydney or Melbourne, mm. and uh, I met them and I said, well, why don't you take a look at Adelaide? And it came out that the National Geographic um, film producers were in Adelaide during Mad Monday, uh, Mad March, when we had the... Uh, the festival, the fringe, and everything, and they went, "Wow, this yeah, place is great!" Well. Uh, so they've made Adelaide the 21st century city. So there you go. Yeah. So that's, 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 that's worked out well. Good. See, that's, that's the way to go. That's good. Well, th mm. thanks, Aureen. We're, we're going to um, open it up to uh, to the floor because uh, uh, the, the the attendees here will have uh, fascinated by uh, by your work. Um, I'd like to ask a question. If you would compare your country with Australia, if possible, from a taxation perspective and focus on uh, perhaps three levels of taxation, personal income tax, the GST or value added tax, and uh, some form of resource tax. And if you would have any advice for the Australian government based on the experience in your country. Okay, thank you, yes. <laughs> I, it's a I'm nice easy question. We are world experts on taxes in Sweden. <laughs> we have millions of them. Now, I think personal tax, we, uh, first of all, we, we cut them, we, the, the general tax, level compared to GDP has come down from something like 60 plus percent to 40 plus percent something. So we've, we've cut taxes generally in Sweden. Uh, we've cut corporate tax uh, down to 22 percent. I think that's sort of a competitive level in Europe. Personal tax, we had this, um, going back to the 1970s again, uh, tax system that became, you know, more and more um, what do you say, crazy, that in the end, uh, tax on certain income was over 100%, which creates very odd incentives in, a, in, a, in an economy. So this was actually particularly on, on like royalties. And there was one, I don't know if you read people long stocking here in Australia, but the author Astrid Lindgren then wrote this story about this, that you know, she was paying 100 and, roughly 105% tax on the royalties on these books. So we've gone from 105% down to um, top marginal tax is 58 today. And uh, the government would like to cut this, but you know, 
once you, it's, it's difficult to cut taxes because you need the money to, to spend on, on social welfare, etc. So I think it will stay uh, at this level for, for some time. Um, so I think we have rather high personal tax rates on income when it comes to marginal tax rates. Uh, uh, VAT is very high in Sweden. It's 25%. Uh, then we have, like other countries start to also adopt, you know, let's say food should not be that much, so we cut on food, and then books should be, you know, 6% or so. But the, the general tax level for VAT is 25. We, I don't know the, the number here in Australia, but it's, it's, it's quite high. So, of course, we have a big apparatus in Sweden where we actually bring in money to the treasury to send it out in, in the system again uh, compared to many, many other nations. So, like in the United States, I think of us as a sort of a communist state because we have so much taxes. But at some level, uh, I think people are prepared to pay taxes in Sweden. Um, we've been, become used to this, and uh, I think the levels are reasonable. I, you know, I'd prefer myself if you could cut the marginal tax <laughs> a little bit. And there is a debate, maybe anything over 50% is kind of, uh, you know, creates very odd incentives. But uh, now, so taxes are quite high still, I would say, uh, in Sweden. There's a, uh, and I don't, know, I don't know the Australian levels at all here, but like so corporate tax rate is 22, marginal tax is 58. Mm -hmm. Uh, most people pay like 30-35% tax average uh, because what you pay, you pay tax at two levels in Sweden, There's a, there is a federal tax, but it's only like 20% of the people that pay federal tax, 80% of people only pay tax to the community, which is to, usually around 30%. Uh, so uh, it's a general tax level. I don't think the Tea Party likes Sweden very much, does it? <laughs> no. Uh, no, no. <gasps> Question. Uh, thank you. Um, in the uh, description of this session, it talks about the talking about the imperative to acquire buy-in from governments to ensure economic success and a creative culture. And you can talk about successful examples, and we can all ignore the unsuccessful and bad ones. Mm. How do governments ensure that they're just not uh, taking a gamble and making bets? Uh, in these areas uh, and, and wasting uh, taxpayers' money. This is the pick and winners type scenario. Yes. Pick, pick and winners, yeah. How do, they, how do they ensure that they are picking winners and, and really what we're describing is not governments doing it and mm. talking about the successful uh, examples? Mm. No, I think there is... Obviously, governments can do good things, they can do bad things. Um, I think we learned some lessons. I think partly why the Swedish government did not buy out Saab, for example, which there was a big pressure on them, was be just because we did that in, the in those days, in the 1970s, where we had big structural adjustments in the textile industry and the shipyard industry and the steel industry. And in those days, uh, government would actually go in and buy out, pretty much become an owner of the steel, of the shipyards, of the textiles, and so forth. So I think at least that is one of the conclusions Government should not own uh, businesses, should not uh, run businesses and own companies. We pretty much getting out that. And still the Swedish government is selling off some of their holdings. Uh, only a few weeks ago, uh, because of the bank crisis in the early 1990s, the Swedish government ended up with one of the big banks, so they sold that off a couple of weeks ago, actually. They sold off telecommunications. They pretty much sold off everything except for uh, one of the big energy companies. Uh, nuclear energy, water energy, and so forth. I think that's one area where government have learned a little bit of the lesson, maybe what not to do. But of course, um, it's, it's difficult just to go, do good policies all the time. Uh, uh, but I think the, the, the big difference between the rich and the poor countries in the world is that in the rich countries, typically, uh, there is democracy. And in a democratic system, if things go astray, there will be political forces, there will be elections and there will be adjustment forces coming up. But in many parts of the world, those adjustments never happen. So, um, so the system just goes on. And, Doesn't and, have the checks uh, and balances. Yeah. I bought uh, in London, I was, I was a visiting professor this spring in London, I bought uh, Zimbabwe dollars. I think it was like $100 trillion. Uh, <laughs> Seems. One, one bill, uh, it's kind of fun to show to people, you know, <laughs> I have $100 trillion. Here. You're a billionaire. So, <laughs> so some, some, some systems go totally astray, but I think, and I think that's why actually this is interesting, and it's, uh, I guess it's 
Professor Robbins is also criticized for that, but he says, you know, that's one of the big issues for China, for example, that they, it has a lot of interesting economic institutions, but when it comes to the political institutions, mm. uh, it is not a democracy, and therefore there are big risks in the whole setup of that political system. Uh, because he, in this book, at least, they think that why nations fail is because the political institutions uh, are, ex in, in the end, extractive, and a certain elites uh, live out of the rest. So That's a bit depressing, that book. The other one's a bit more optimistic. Yeah. <laughs> uh, two more questions, yes. Uh, I, I just recently came from, back from Greece where there is a lot of discussion about austerity measures and how they have been imposed on them by the Germans. But I would like to open that question mm. a bit more to the divide in Europe between the countries that feel they're being um, exploited maybe by the North and the mm. South. Could you mention mm. something about austerity? And this is a sure. solution for Europe. If the South really tightens its belt, will it make them rich? Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for your question. Well, I think, uh, I think, first of all, I think the European Union and the whole European project is, is very, very important as a peace project, which is a very is one you know, particular thing. Uh, you know, we don't want another war in Europe. But when it comes to Europe as an economic project, uh, uh, when it comes to monetary policy and fiscal policy and so forth, it, it is not that easy. <laughs> Obviously, uh, if you look at the institutions, uh, both the political institutions and the economic institutions, they vary a lot across Europe, across countries, but also within countries sometimes. And, and uh, you know, and when we put this into, even into a monetary union, uh, and you put in Greece at the same time as Germany, it's like, uh, you know, to exaggerate a little bit, it's like putting in, uh, you know, a, a, a developing country and a developed country into the same monetary union. It's not, it's not really that easy. And maybe uh, the political power and force of showing a united Europe was so strong that they tended to... Um, to be a little bit naive about the, the enormous differences in, in uh, rule of law and uh, you know levels of competition and you know like etc. A number of things when it comes to uh, different kinds of, of uh, both economic and political institutions and and after some time it's you realize it's not that easy that uh, they are all in the same same uh, monetary same uh, same um, same uh, monetary union uh, with the euro uh, lending at the same rates and so forth so. And the odd thing is that uh, I think the, the people in, in Greece should be really happy that Germany is around, but it turns out the other way. They feel, the feeling among the people is that, you know, we don't want to be ruled by the Germans, but I think uh, the only hope for the, for the Greek economy is that actually the German economy is there as, as, the, as, as the strong economy of Europe. Uh, of course, they could, they could leave, Greece could leave the, the uh, monetary union, they could leave, uh, you know, some of these institutions, which would mean uh, going back to poverty very, very quickly. You would, uh, you know, the value of the currency, you would, you know, you would cut half everything, uh, every, everything, you know, that you, uh, it's, it's valued at some, 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 if you cut, if you devalue the currency by, let's say, 50%, you know, everything in Greece becomes half mm. worth. Mm. So that would be the, the result of it. So I think there should be thankful actually that Germany is around the protecting the euro, but uh, in the end maybe it will fall apart because these differences are enormous. But again, I would, where I started, we should not, re not forget that the initial force of all these uh, sort of European institution building is actually about a peace project, and I think that project is, is uh, <laughs> so, so important. This is the final question. Thank you. Uh, about 30 years ago, Australia had one of the most egalitarian distributions of wealth in the world. But like many countries in the last 30 years, that's become a lot less. Mm -hmm. So now about five, the top 1% own about 10% of our wealth. It's epitomized by the United States, where the top 1% own about 30% of the wealth. And I think that that potentially leads to inequality, declining health, can lead mm -hmm. to a decline in trust and break down institutions. Mm -hmm. And I believe that one of the re that's one of the reasons the United States is breaking down, because there's this complete divide. And mm. I wondered if you'd like to comment on that as it applies to Sweden and applies in general. Okay, yeah, thank you. Okay. Thank you, yeah. You know, there are strong forces. Uh, I don't know the numbers for, for Sweden, but I think, uh, again, uh, I would agree. I, I have a sense that we are on the same, uh, same turf there, that uh, if you want 
uh, a, God, a, a good, uh, not a God, uh, a good <laughs> economic uh, development of a country, you need to, to spread wealth reasonably among the population. Otherwise, you get these extractive institutions where a few make all their living out of the, the rest, which is you know, partly the problem in, in South America, for example, and in many parts of Africa and parts of Asia and so forth. So, yes, some of those tendencies are, shows that countries like the United States and others is, is going in that sense maybe backwards when it comes to, to those institutions that Professor Robinson talks about that makes uh, uh, inclusiveness of, 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 of everyone. And I think, you know, part of this is shown as you know, the, the CEO compensation and the bonus systems, et cetera. And it, uh, I saw some numbers, it used to be like, you know, uh, the average worker level as opposed to the CEO level it used to be one to 10, 1 to 20, 1 to 40, now it's 1 to 400, 1 to 500, so yep, these, these differences are, are becoming bigger and bigger and bigger. And you get a lot of um, uh, turmoil and, and, uh, and, 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 and problems in, in society out of that. And I, but I think still countries like uh, in the Nordic countries, etc., uh, have, a, have a much more close distribution. But of course, if you take the Soviet model, they try to, or some, also some African countries, they try to say, you know, you know, we'll, we'll collapse this. In the, there's no difference, and that also creates problems. I remember I, many years back, I was I lived in Tokyo for a year, and I had a friend at the university. He was from an African country, and uh, I, I, I asked him about this, and he said, yeah, yeah, no, the officially, you know, the top levels salaries are only, can only be four times, you know, the lowest. Uh, so, but of course, we we have all the other systems to 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 adjust for that. So I have, I have you know free house with free car with free. I mean, so, so they create all the systems and institutions to to circumvent this official rule of uh, maximum difference, like four to one or something like that. Or, bargaining or, or all the corporations and government and so forth. So, yeah, you. I mean, you need a difference, but the big big differences would create. Uh, I think. Uh, Society that can that can yeah. fail, and I think the U.S. is a big problem in that. Well, Orvin, th thanks very much for your time. We we'd love to have you back in Australia and uh, yeah. <laughs> safe <laughs> travels back to Sweden, ladies and gentlemen. Right, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.